Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Working Conversations podcast, where we talk all things leadership, business communication, and trends in organizational life. I'm your host, Dr. Janelle Anderson. A snarky dig at a colleague in a Slack channel. Snubbing someone's idea on an email thread that includes a dozen coworkers. A disrespectful comment about the person running a Zoom meeting in the chat during that meeting broadcast to all the meeting participants. More and more, we are running into these situations and worse at work. It's like people have lost their inhibition and their professionalism along with it. And to an extent they have. The phenomenon is called the online disinhibition effect and it's on the rise. Today, we're diving deep into the fascinating world of the online disinhibition effect, or as I like to call it, Unleashing the Unfiltered. In our digital age, where we're constantly plugged in, this phenomenon is shaping the way we interact online, and mostly, it's doing more harm than good. But before we get started, let me unpack what is meant by the online disinhibition effect, so that we're all on the same page about what this phenomenon actually is. In the simplest terms, the online disinhibition effect, which I will refer to ODE some of the times during this podcast, is the phenomenon where people behave differently, often more openly and uninhibited when they're online compared to how they behave in face-to-face settings. It's like wearing a mask at a masquerade ball, except that the mask is a keyboard and the ball is a virtual chat room or a social media platform, or maybe even a chain of emails at work. It's nothing new. It's been studied by researchers for over two decades, but it's more alive and present in the workplace than ever before, given the number of people who've started working from home during the pandemic and have continued to work from home since then. And given how communicating through communication technology tends to have a dehumanizing effect. But why does it happen? What's behind the masks and the overly candid behavior? Well, there are several factors at play here. The first factor is invisibility. In the digital realm, we can't see the immediate reactions of our audience, which can lead to a sense of detachment. The lack of eye contact and body language cues can embolden people to express themselves more freely if they don't see the faces of the people that they're talking to. And this can happen when you're at work and you're in a Teams meeting or a Zoom meeting and people don't have their cameras on. It's easy to feel more detached and fail to consider how someone will feel about what you say. Another factor is asynchronicity. Online interactions often occur asynchronously, meaning there's a delay or a lag between sending a message and receiving a response. This happens in email, Slack, and in Microsoft Teams messaging and the like. This temporal gap can result in people typing out their unfiltered thoughts without thinking them through before posting or hitting send, leading to rash statements, unprofessionalism, and things that people would never say to somebody else's face. Another factor is the potential for minimal consequences. The perceived consequences of our online actions can seem minimal, especially when we're communicating with coworkers that we've never met in person. If you're both working remotely or you're in different geographic locations, you may not have developed much of a relationship. So the coworker you're communicating with feels like a bit of a stranger to you. And in fact, most of our interactions with strangers do have minimal consequences. Think of an altercation with a stranger over a parking spot in a grocery store parking lot. Unless you live in a small town, it's quite likely that you'll never see that person again. A similar sentiment can occur with colleagues whom you've never met and rarely have their cameras on when in meetings together. But of course, you are going to encounter them again. But at first blush, your brain might think about minimal consequences. And that reduced sense of accountability can lead to riskier behavior. Case in point, the keyboard warrior. Let's take a little detour and meet the infamous keyboard warrior. We all know one or two of these, don't we? These are the individuals who, from the safety of their digital fortress, unleash an unrelenting storm of opinions, perhaps insults, and sarcasm. But when you picture a keyboard warrior, remember that there's often more to the story. 
Imagine the following scenario. Dave, a mild-mannered accountant at your company, works from home and has strong feelings about compliance issues related to the accounting work that he does. He wants accurate data, on time, and in the format that he's requested. From the comfort of his home, he passionately argues his points with you and the rest of the team, chastising people for being late with their finance data or having it ill-formatted, challenging anyone who dare oppose him. Now, in real life, Dave would not dream of raising his voice during a meeting, much less a heated debate, but online, he becomes a fierce advocate for his beliefs. This transformation is a classic example of the online disinhibition effect. Being relatively invisible over email, coupled with the absence of immediate consequences and the absence of your immediate reaction, allows Dave to release his inner warrior without fear of repercussions. And of course, it doesn't just happen at work. It happens all over the internet, on social media and on discussion sites, in the comments sections, on blogs and news articles, and on and on. All right, now that we've covered the basics, let's explore the multifaceted nature of this phenomenon, including the good, the bad, and the ugly. We'll start with the good. Now, believe it or not, the online disinhibition effect isn't all negative. Dropping your filter can foster creativity and innovation. With the invisibility, asynchronicity, and the minimal consequences, people may be more likely to share off-the-wall ideas without being as self-conscious about how those ideas might be perceived as they would if they were face-to-face. Sometimes in in in-person brainstorming sessions, participants feel an overwhelming sense of pressure to come up with only good ideas and they might self-censor in ways that preclude creativity and innovation. So that's the first positive thing that can come out of it. The second positive thing that can come out of it is that it can foster genuine connections as people feel more comfortable sharing their personal experiences and their emotions online. For example, individuals dealing with mental health issues might be more willing to disclose what they're going through and share it with their colleagues. In turn, those colleagues may be more understanding and more compassionate, and they may fully relate to and share their own similar situations. We see this a lot on social media platforms. When someone has suffered a loss or is going through a really tough time, that person might not feel comfortable sharing those same experiences out loud with a group of people, but we may be surprised to see them make a very vulnerable post describing what they're going through. They find the space to do so in an online supportive community. So that's the second thing. It can foster genuine connections. Okay, that's the good. Now for the bad. The dark side of online disinhibition is all too familiar. Cyberbullying, hate speech, and trolling are prime examples across the whole breadth of the internet. But it happens at work too. When people feel invulnerable behind their screens, they may engage in hurtful behavior, snarky comments, rudeness, and flat-out disrespectful behavior that they would never consider doing or saying in person. Such actions can have severe consequences, both emotionally and psychologically. If you're the person doing them, they can also have consequences on your career. And I'll get into those consequences next when we cover the ugly. Yes, it is the good, the bad, and the ugly. So let's get to the real heart of the matter, the ugly side of online disinhibition. You see, the internet can sometimes feel like a lawless wild west with trolls and extremists running amok. And this is where things get tricky. Because while invisibility and asynchronicity and disinhibition can empower voices for good, they can also get people into hot, hot water at work. There are more horror stories than we have time for that describe how people have tanked their careers, getting fired, getting blocked from future opportunities in their fields at worst, and causing reputational harm that limits their career options with their current employer at best. I'll share a few so that you can get an idea of what I'm talking about. One of the earliest and most notable happened in 2002 when Heather Armstrong, who had started a blog the prior year, was busted 
when her coworkers discovered that she had been writing about them on her blog and not in a complimentary way. She was essentially writing satire about the day to day interactions with her coworkers, chastising them and making fun of them. Once it was discovered, she was promptly fired. Now, interesting side note here. She went on to continue writing and blogging, and she made a decent career for herself as a writer. But that is relatively uncommon. Another early example resulting in termination happened in 2009 when a young woman dished on Facebook about how boring and awful her job was, entirely forgetting that she was Facebook friends with her boss. And then there was a daycare worker in Newport News, Virginia, who posted photos of the children that she cared for at the daycare center on her Instagram feed with snarky, cruel comments about those children and how her day went. One of the kids' moms found the posts and reported it, and the woman was fired immediately. Yes, these are egregious examples and perhaps a bit extreme. But that is what can happen when ODE is left unchecked. Now, more commonly, it will show up as rude, disrespectful behavior that is not typically a fireable offense. After all, in most cases, people don't get fired for being rude. Now, there are exceptions. If they are frontline employees and customer service is their top job responsibility and they are rude to customers, Yes, that is a fireable offense. But if they're an office worker, say in marketing or software development, they're probably not going to get fired for being rude, presuming they're productive and their work is reasonably high quality. However, when someone is rude at work, it is not without consequences. Corn Ferry International, a consulting firm, conducted a survey about the increase in rudeness And their findings show that it's not just annoying or upsetting. It actually decreases people's workplace effectiveness in their jobs when they're on the receiving end of the rude behavior. Basically, rudeness makes the people who are targeted worse at their jobs. In a related study conducted at Georgetown University, the researchers found that those who experienced rudeness came up with 39% fewer creative ideas and performed 33% worse in solving problems. Now, most of the employers that I talk to want more creativity and better problem solving from their staff, not less. Rudeness is on the rise at work since the pandemic began. The Corn Ferry study that I mentioned found that 59% of respondents said that colleagues were more rude compared to pre-pandemic times. 59%. And that's not surprising now that you know about the online disinhibition effect. Seven in 10 coworkers agreed that working remotely made it easier for colleagues to be rude through behaviors such as interrupting on phone calls and WebEx meetings and not returning emails. And 25% of people reported remote work enabled rudeness, quote, to a great extent. Okay, so now that we know what it is and what it looks like, How can we counteract this effect and promote healthier online interactions at work? Here are a few strategies to consider. First, digital literacy training. This means educating your staff about the consequences of online actions and the psychology behind online disinhibition. Both of those things can go a long way in fostering responsible behavior when staff are online. Now, students in our schools often have digital literacy training where they're learning about how to comport themselves online, and it's really no different than that. We have lost a certain edge to our professionalism with all the work from home, and so bringing that back in the form of some digital literacy training would be instrumental for getting the rudeness out of the space and the decorum back in the space and getting people to be a little bit less disinhibited, in fact, a little bit more critical about what they post online. Data collection and reporting tools. Now, large companies are already using platforms that observe what employees are doing. 
with further moderation of what's being said in their computer-mediated work communication, and not that I'm recommending that because I am all for workplace privacy, but when it is in place and employees know that their communication may be monitored and observed, the possibility of being discovered may reduce toxic behavior and create more respectful online communication in an online environment. So it does have some possible upside, that monitoring of day-to-day communication. Next, promote empathy. Encourage empathy by reminding your employees and your staff that there is a real person behind every screen name, behind every box on a Microsoft Teams meeting, even if they don't have their camera on. There is a real person behind that box. And remembering that can lead to more respectful interactions. And finally, encourage critical thinking. Teach critical thinking skills to your employees. When individuals have strong critical thinking skills, they are far less likely to fall into the trap of echo chambers, extremism, rude behavior, and disrespectful communication in the workplace. So encourage those critical thinking skills and give critical thinking skills training to your staff. Now, as we wind down this discussion of the online disinhibition effect, let me leave you with these thoughts. In the ever-evolving landscape of work, where remote collaboration and digital communication are the new norms, understanding ODE is crucial. It shapes how we interact in the workplace how we handle remote teams, and even how we approach conflict resolution, especially when we're online or working remotely. As we continue our journey into the future of work, it's important to strike a balance between the benefits of online disinhibition and its potential pitfalls, which are many. Let's leverage the power of online connectivity while remaining mindful of its challenges. Remember, While the internet can sometimes bring out the worst in us, it also has the potential to bring out our best. So whether you're working from home once in a while or pretty much every day, keep the online disinhibition effect in mind as you navigate the virtual intersections of the world of work. It's a phenomenon that's here to stay and understanding it is key to ensuring a more harmonious digital future where people's careers, their professional development, and the companies that they work for can thrive. Remember, the future of work is not only about technology. It's also about the values we uphold, the communities we build, and the sustainable growth that we strive for. We need to keep exploring, keep innovating, and keep envisioning the remarkable possibilities that lie ahead. As always, stay curious, stay informed, and stay ahead of the curve. Tune in next Monday for another insightful exploration of the trends shaping our professional world. Until then, my friends, be well.